pembicaraan kita. Oke, okay, uh, a very good uh, afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, patience uh, to wait for the webinar. And my apology on behalf of the committee because we miscalculate uh, the time difference from uh, Jakarta to the Netherlands. I thought it was uh, five hours, but then it was it is a uh, six hours difference. So and uh, Professor Selin is uh, kindly uh, <laughs> to to rectify my mistake uh, of this time difference, and she is here now. And um, uh, today uh, we have uh, a very good uh, opportunity uh, to uh, start our very first. Uh, uh professorial uh, guest lecture of the Indonesian Society of uh, International Law Lecturers. Uh, this is an association of uh, uh, law lecturers that specialize in international law all over Indonesia. And uh, one of the uh, uh, program that uh, we are conducting right now is to have a professional professorial uh, guest lecture that we're going to have uh, from professors in Indonesia and also from the overseas. And uh, today, uh, Professor Selin uh, has uh, uh, the honor uh, to open this inaugural uh, uh, guest lecture. Uh, and if I may, uh, I would like to uh, read uh, her uh, profile uh, based on the website. I'm sure you can uh, uh, see on the website. Professor Selin uh, Trevisanut uh, held, held a chair or professor on international law and sustainability at Utrecht University since uh, 1st February 2018. She joined Utrecht in 2012 as a Marie Curie Fellow and in the period of 2012-2014 mainly worked on her research project about international law of offshore installation cutting through fragmented regimes toward better governance. Uh, in December 2014, she was granted uh, an ERC starting grant for her project, accommodating new interests at sea, legal tools for sustainable ocean governance. The project started in October 2015 and studies, studies how uh, the law can contribute to the sustainable use of the ocean. It aims to offer a theory of interest and regime interaction in ocean governance. It focuses on the interplay between the law of the sea, climate change law, and energy law. She also conducts research within the Utrecht Center for Water, Ocean, and Sustainability Law and teaches general international law, international environmental law, and ocean law and policy. Um, before joining Utrecht University, Celine conducted research and taught in many academic institutions, including Columbia University, the European University Institute, the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law, and the Universities of Cagliari, Milan, and Trento. She holds a law degree from University of Paris 1, Pantheon Sorbonne, and a PhD in international law from uh, the University of Milan. And uh, she has wrote uh, many uh, uh, articles and also uh, books and uh, book chapters. And she has also uh, held uh, an editorial uh, board, including the Netherlands Yearbook of International Law and Questions of uh, International Law. This afternoon, Professor Selin uh, is kindly to share her uh, knowledge and uh, her uh, research that she has wrote on the uh, very uh, masterpiece on the prompt release. So if I may share with you that uh, in Indonesia, now we are discussing about uh, the policy on combating the eye fishing. After we have a tough, uh, uh, tough uh, policy uh, on illegal fishing, now we try to think about a more sustainable policy in uh, combating eye fishing. And one of the policy is uh, uh, the implementation of the prom release. Nevertheless, uh, we are still uh, uh, looking for the, the right uh, form, the right policy in uh, implementing the prom release. So with uh, Celine's uh, kind uh, sharing, we hope that we can get uh, a more clearer picture of how the practice and theory 
uh, from um, uh, uh, from the international practices. Uh, for your information, Celine, uh, the audience here is consisted not only uh, the international lecturers, but also our students and also some uh, government officials that uh, might be really keen uh, looking forward to your uh, lecture. I guess without further ado, I would like to give the, uh, the floor and time to you. Celine. Thank you very much, Ari, and I'm very honored uh, to be the first guest of this uh, lecture series. Um, and uh, I, I thank uh, Ari personally for inviting me, but also the association uh, for giving me uh, this uh, possibility. Um, so um, when contacted for today's lecture, uh, I was asked to uh, give a lecture on the prompt release uh, procedure. I will share my desk with you um, and the PowerPoint, one second. Here we go. Can you all see it? Is it fine on the screen? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and uh, so the, the prompt release indeed is a, is a quite peculiar procedure and it, it raises uh, many questions and issues. And at the moment, however, the, 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 the practice, the international practice remains uh, uh, quite uh, limited to a certain extent. So uh, there is, uh, I'm sure, also quite a bit to learn from what you are developing in Indonesia. And, and I really look forward to the, the Q&A session afterwards to also hear uh, what are the main issues that you are dealing with and, and uh, how you are dealing uh, with them. Um, but uh, without further ado, uh, let me start uh, this uh, presentation, which uh, I uh, will speak around 30 minutes. Is that fine, Amy? I see that you are nodding, so yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and oh, how can I go here? Yes, um, and this is the outline of the lecture. So first of all, I want to, uh, I will follow a bit the, 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 the usual uh, steps of a, a judicial procedure. So to look at, first of all, the admissibility issues. Uh, so who can trigger uh, the, um, the procedure and how it has been uh, regulated in the convention and what are the problems related to what we have in the convention and that have emerged in the cases. And then uh, uh, the second part, I will focus in what I think is uh, the most interesting bit for uh, states who are trying to um, indeed uh, frame and, and regulate this issue at the domestic level, which is, well, what is the relationship actually between the domestic and the international level? Um, so what type of procedure is the prompt release and which degree of autonomy does it have, the international procedure, in respect of the domestic uh, procedures ongoing. And then, of course, the reasonableness of the bond, uh, which is the core of the uh, procedure and which has, uh, which is still very much debated, as uh, I will tell you in a bit. And then I will present some very brief concluding remarks. Um, so, to start with the admissibility issues. Um, so first of all, the prompt release procedure is, as I said, it's quite a peculiar uh, procedure in the international uh, arena um, because it, it has a very uh, specific objective in a way, which is to strike a balance between the interest of the coastal states and the flag states. And it was invented in uh, the UNCLOS, during the UNCLOS negotiations as a reaction actually to the creation of the EZ regime. So coastal states um, were of course very much interested in having uh, EZ that would have extended their jurisdiction on large uh, portions of the sea. And uh, as a re reaction to that, as a, a sort of rebalancing uh, exercise, flag states wanted a sort of protection for their fleets. Um, and that's how the prompt release came into being. So this idea that yes, uh, coastal states can indeed extend their jurisdiction and can enforce in a, a larger portion of the sea, but uh, flag states have a way to protect their interests, to protect their industry through this prompt release, uh, which limits 
actually the discretion of coastal states in the, their enforcement. But this prompt release uh, procedure, because of this exceptional also uh, objective, is limited to two fields uh, specifically. One is illegal fishing, and we find it in Article 73 of the Law of the Sea Convention, and the other one is vessel source pollution, and we find, them it, and we find it in Article 220 and 226. So, we, then the procedure itself, you find it in, our, in part 15 of the convention, which is the one dedicated to dispute settlement. Um, and uh, it is a quite long article, Article 292 uh, of the uh, Law of the Sea Convention, which deals uh, with the uh, prompt release procedure. So the prompt release procedure is an exceptional procedure in a way, which is um, uh, justified by the uh, expeditiousness of the situation. So it's, it's uh, to react to a sort of emergency uh, uh, situation. We have two procedures in the Law of the Sea Convention which have this function. One is the request for provisional measures, which is more classical and anyone who has studied law knows about provisional measures which exist also at the domestic level. And the other one is um, the prompt release procedure. So as you can read uh, from Article 292 uh, Paragraph 1, um, actually the state, uh, the flag state, can ask actually within 10 days from the time of detention uh, for the tribunal to assess whether uh, the, the, the bond was reasonable and to request for the release if that was not possible in front of the domestic courts. So 10 days is really a very short uh, time, um, as you can see. And the reason why is that the economic interests involved are very high. So uh, you, well, you are all very well aware that to block uh, at, uh, in the port for more than 10 days a vessel transporting uh, fish uh, is, is a problem uh, uh, and it costs a lot of money uh, to the owners and uh, to the insurance company. And the same if we talk about the, the pollution side for oil tankers, for instance, or cargoes more generally. So to stop their route uh, for a long period of time is, uh, of course, very expensive for the, the owner. So this very peculiar uh, rapid uh, um, procedure uh, and the Law of the Sea Tribunal has a sort of uh, uh, residual compulsory jurisdiction in the sense that it, it is not necessarily the tribunal in front of which the case has to be brought in the sense that prompt release should be guaranteed um, also uh, at the domestic level and states could agree also to bring a prompt release case in front of another jurisdiction, for instance, also an arbitral tribunal, that, that could be possible. But it has never happened so far um, because of the uh, expeditiousness of the situation. So the tribunal is already in session, is already existing. So it's easier, it's faster to go in front of a tribunal which is already there. Um, so for now, all international cases of prompt release have been brought in front of ICLOS, but ICLOS is not the only jurisdiction uh, competent eventually to know of a prompt release case, as the uh, uh, Article 292 uh, paragraph 1 at the end says, parties can agree otherwise and can decide to bring the case in front of another jurisdiction. So, uh, and this is the same, uh, so the, this residual compulsory jurisdiction uh, that the ITLOS has also in, uh, prompt, in the provisional measures uh, procedures. Uh, the application for the release can be made uh, by the flag state or on behalf of the flag state. So this is one of the peculiarities of uh, this procedure. Uh, and for you to know, at the moment, uh, nine cases of prompt release had been brought in front of the 
uh, of Italos, and only three of them were directly brought by the flag state. So in most cases, actually, in the majority of cases, is on behalf of the flag state. What does that mean? Um, who is the person who can act on behalf of the flag state? Well, usually it's the ship owner or the insurance company. Um, and it cannot go directly in front of the tribunal. It needs, of course, to have a delegation, uh, a mandate, a written mandate from the flag state, giving that private actor the possibility to trigger the procedure in front of ITLOS. This also uh, shows even more, if you want, the peculiarity of the procedure and which are the interests interests really protected by the procedure um, as also uh, private entities are can act almost directly in front of the tribunal uh, of course with a sort of veil uh, of this mandate uh, from uh, the flag state um, the flag state is the uh, nationality state of the vessel and it doesn't matter that the crew uh, has different nationalities. The vessel is considered as a unit uh, and only the flag state of the vessel will be entitled to ask for the prompt release of the vessel. Okay, I'm so sorry. What is that? Uh, I did put a not disturb, but Okay, I'll try. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> um, so the vessel is a unit and it has the nationality of, uh, the, uh, of the flag state, of the registration of the vessel. Uh, as I said, private parties can uh, um, act on behalf of a flag state um, but they don't have an independent right to act. Uh, so they cannot actually go in front of it laws to ask on their own right uh, the, for the release of the vessel and the crew. It is still the flag state, which is the order of the right. Now, the Procedure wants to be an autonomous uh, procedure. What does that mean? That uh, it is, it aimed, as I said, uh, to protect the interests of the flag state mainly um, and of the industry uh, which is protected by the flag state. So the idea is that uh, at least in theory, that it does not have an impact on the merits in front of the domestic courts. Uh, so the, the court or tribunal, so in this case, ITLOS, which is dealing with a request of provisional measure, uh, of, uh, sorry, of prompt release, <laughs> has only to deal with the request of prompt release, and it's not supposed to assess uh, or decide on the merits of the case, which is pending most of the time still in front of the competent authorities uh, in, in the detaining state. Okay. So the detaining state remains competent for the release also. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the competent state is still continuing its normal procedure it's the it's it's uh, pr it's uh, authorities are still competent for the merits and will be the one uh, in charge then of the release of the vessel and of the crew okay the decision of the court it's only on when eventually that release should take place and whether the bond which has been requested by the domestic uh, authorities is reasonable in light of international law. Okay, that is what we have in theory in, on paper. In practice, the relationship between what happens at the domestic level and what happens at the international level is actually quite blurred. And of course, it has in, an impact. Uh, the way in which the tribunal will assess the, the facts 
uh, which uh, of the case pending in front of uh, the domestic court will have an impact on what the domestic courts are going to do. So that's why the autonomy of the procedure is quite debated and criticized. So as I said, uh, in theory, uh, the prompt release uh, procedure uh, is an independent remedy, which has the tribunal said also, it is not an appeal against a national court. Uh, it's not an appeal. So also it does not disrupt um, the different degrees of jurisdiction in front of the domestic courts. Uh, it's something completely autonomous on a different channel, if you want, than what happens at the domestic level. But as I said, the tribunal, it laws, is still called upon to review what the coastal state is doing at the domestic level, because how will the state as, uh, how will ITLOS assess whether the state is in compliance with the criteria for the detention of vessels and crew and with the condition for their release? Mm -hmm. So the tribunal it has to assess the reasonableness of the enforcement system of the coastal state. And it is a, 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 a quite broad assessment uh, uh, because it, it considers also issues of due process of law and considerations of humanity. So the considerations of humanity uh, concerns uh, concern the uh, conditions of detention of the crew mainly. So whether uh, they are treated fairly, uh, there have not been submitted to torture or other in, in human and degrading treatments. So some minimum standards of treatment for uh, the members of the crew uh, during the detention, during the arrest and the detention. Also the circumstances of the arrest are taken into account by the tribunal, not only the detention. Okay. And then due process of law, which is well, could the, the crew and the ship owner and the insurance company have access to uh, some remedy? Uh, could they actually bring a claim in front of a competent authority to ask for the release of the vessel and of the crew? Um, is there any sort of authority? And the, the international law or, or the law of the sea in particular doesn't say which type of authority should be competent. This is upon the state and its own legal system to decide if it is a criminal, a civil, uh, uh, an administrative type of authority, if it is a tribunal uh, dealing with the prompt release, or if it is a, a, a port authority at the, uh, as a first step which deals with it. There is no uh, obligation there, mandatory criteria from uh, an international law perspective. So it's really up for the, to the state, to the detaining state uh, to organize that system. But there should be a system which guarantees a due process of law so that the detaining, uh, the detained crew has a possibility to go in front of an authority to ask for the release. One issue which has been looked at in particular in the Tomimaru case uh, between Jam Japan and Russia was the issue of confiscation. Um, so in that case, uh, Russia uh, had uh, already uh, confiscated on the basis of uh, uh, the decision of a local tribunal, the vessel. And that was not only a simple seizure and detention, but a clear confiscation. So with the uh, passage of property, uh, of ownership from the private actor to actually the state in that case. Uh. Um, and that was considered by the tribunal to exceed what is uh, feasible in the framework of uh, prompt release of vessels and crews, because at that stage, it should not be already a sanction because of course, and then also uh, because it would defeat also the, the, the purpose of the prompt release, because by confiscating right away 
the vessel, you uh, actually move the ownership of uh, the vessel, and then it changes also who can act against the release. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's um, uh, for the release. So that also uh, creates a sort of ambiguous situation. So confiscation uh, it has been discussed by the tribunal. It is uh, to a certain extent uh, possible, they say, as long as it does not hamper completely the objectives of a prompt release procedure. Which means that, of course, if you change the ownership completely of the vessel, then even if it is released, the original owner will not be able to have the good back. So that defeats the purpose of the procedure. The reasonableness of the bond, which is the core uh, of uh, the, the, the procedure. Um, so actually, the law of the sea convention doesn't say anything of how to assess the reasonableness of the bond. And so ITLOS uh, found itself uh, to, uh, yeah, to have to look for criteria, uh, also in general international law, but mainly uh, actually in domestic law. So, um, first of all, uh, it, the, the, the tribunal in its case law clarified what are the objectives of the bond? Why do we have a bond uh, in exchange for the uh, prompt release of the vessel and of the crew? And the first objective of the bond is to provide assurance to the detaining state as to the effectiveness of the final judgment and of its authorities. So the aim is uh, that, yes, the coastal state has to release because of the very high economic interests which are involved in the specific industry. But this limitation to its enforcement powers should not uh, hamper, should not undermine the effectiveness of its own legal system, and in particular of the final judgment in if there is, if the breach is ascertained. So that's the final aim of it. And at the same time, the bond, uh, in order to be reasonable, uh, needs to strike a fair balance between the rights of the flag state, the ship owner and the crew, the prompt release, and the right of the coastal state to try and punish. So all these elements are taken into account by the tribunal when assessing the reasonableness of the bond. Which are the criteria developed by ITLOS on the basis of those general objectives? One is that in order to assess the reasonableness of the bond, the tribunal will look at the gravity of the alleged offenses. So which type of offense are, is the crew accused of? And how uh, serious is the offense uh, in basis of what? Of the domestic legal system. Because how can the tribunal assess the gravity of the offense okay, um, on the basis of international law? that becomes a bit more complicated because of course we do not have necessarily the same uh, a uniform, let's say, uh, system of sanctions at the international level. So certain offenses are considered more serious in certain states than in others. So in order to assess the reasonableness of the bond which is set by the domestic uh, authorities, it looks, decided to look at, well, at the seriousness of this offense on the basis of the same legal system. So which are the penalty imposed for the specific offenses on the basis of the domestic system? And, and that poses a bit of a problem because on the one hand, the tribunal, and I, I reported the quote uh, of the Monte Confurco case here, uh, an international tribunal is not supposed to apply domestic law. Hmm? 
except maybe an arbitral tribunal if the two parties have decided that a specific issue is submitted to a domestic legal order. But otherwise, as it is the case for ITLOS, which is a, a permanent uh, court, the, the, the tribunal applies international law. It applies the convention, first of all, but also general international law and other rules of international law which are applicable to the specific case. This is the applicable law uh, provision of, uh, for the tribunal. So how to deal with domestic law in its assessment? So following a, a very traditional approach, the tribunal said that the laws of the detaining states and the decisions of its courts are considered as relevant facts and not as applicable law. But here the line is quite blurred again, because it's on the basis of these relevant facts that the gravity of the offense is assessed and consequently the reasonableness of the bond. So they are indirectly almost applicable law also for the tribunal. And that creates a bit of an issue because the tribunal is actually assessing, in, in a way, the reasonableness of the application of the domestic law. And that, of course, make, puts it in a bit of a weird position as it is supposed to be an autonomous procedure, which is not evaluating or assessing the procedure on the merits in front of the domestic courts. So this is one important part of the exercise of uh, assessment and evaluation by ITLOS, which is uh, the, the, the most complicated part. Also in the judgments, you will see that they go quite uh, into detail. And it's also a difficult one for the judges because while well, most of the time they are not really familiar with the domestic legal system of the detaining state. Um, so they, uh, yes, they, 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 they might rely most of the time on uh, translations of the domestic law uh, and they don't, yeah, they are not familiar uh, with uh, the, 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 the majority, uh, the, the, the um, prevalent uh, interpretation also of those laws. Uh, so it's, it's a quite difficult exercise. Combined to that, ITLOS considers the value of the detained vessel and of the cargo, and then uh, the uh, amount of the bond imposed by the detaining states and its form. So the state can uh, ask for a bond in different forms. It can also be a financial security, uh, for instance. Um, and there is some flexibility there for the detaining state on how to do it. And the, the ITLOS will look at all those elements uh, together to consider whether the requested bond is reasonable on the basis of international law. If you look at the cases, um, every time ITLOS has decreased the amount of the bond requested by the detaining state. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that has also raised some criticism uh, because of the assessment of the gravity of the offense. Mm -hmm. So there, there, is, there is at least, uh, maybe not explicit, but uh, when we look at the cases, there is a tendency uh, of the tribunal to um, yeah, diminish a bit the gravity of the offense uh, and then to justify also in that way the uh, a lower bond. Uh, then, of course, there are discussions as well on the actual value of the vessel and of the cargo and uh, on how it has been assessed and uh, the moment in which it has been assessed and so on and so forth. And those, but those are more objective criteria which are easier to, to, to ascertain and, and also to contest eventually. Uh, another one, it, it's the more subjective exercise of assessing the gravity of the offense, which is the more criticized part also of the case law of ITLOS. 
A last point on the reasonableness of uh, uh, the bond is uh, that uh, the tribunal has had so far a quite restrictive interpretation of what the bond uh, should be. And it only includes uh, financial and, and uh, financial, it has to have a financial nature. It has to be an economic bond, uh, financial bond. And it has actually uh, denied uh, the possibility to include uh, other non-financial conditions, uh, such as in the case of the Volga between uh, Russia and Australia, Australia, uh, wanted to impose also the uh, installation of a, a satellite monitoring system on the Volga to make sure that the vessel pending the, the, the procedure in front of the domestic courts would not again fish illegally in the Kamala region. Okay, So it wanted to impose some sort of surveillance on the Volga and the tribunal said no, because this is not a bond. Uh, this is uh, the bond needs to be only financial. And that again has raised quite some criticism uh, because it's true that the Law of the Sea Convention only uh, indicates financial and uh, bonds, uh, financial security um, bonds. Uh, but at the same time, the legal context has changed. Uh, uh, we have more and more rules for the protection of the environment, for the management of living resources. And so also non-financial uh, bonds uh, could be a, a, a way also for the detaining state to guarantee the effectiveness of the final judgment on the merits. So there is here uh, some, some criticism uh, against uh, uh, the, the practice, against the case law of the ITLOS on, for not opening up to other possibilities uh, in relation to the bond. So to conclude, um, as I mentioned, uh, this is quite a peculiar international procedure. Uh, we don't have anything comparable in any other subfield of international law. Um, so it was uh, created by UNCLOS and it was developed by ITLOS. It is not really an interstate dispute, as I mentioned uh, a few times, uh, as you, we've seen also for the, from the practice. Most of the cases are actually of a private entity against the state uh, through the veil of this interstate dispute, but uh, actually it's the, 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 the cheap owner or the insurance company which is protecting its own interest. Um, the private sector has a very important role to play in these procedures, uh, both as um, uh, actors uh, as applicants, but also they are the ones paying <laughs> the bond, actually. Uh, it's not the flag state, it's the private actor play, play, paying the bond. Um, so that also, uh, as I said, blurs this kind of idea that it's an international interstate dispute. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned uh, in, uh, in the last, for considering the last slide, uh, there are a lot of uh, criticism about the criteria for assessing the reasonableness of the bond, which are considered unsatisfactory. Um, so one, because there is no consideration of other interests, uh, such as the protection of the marine environment and the effectiveness of uh, regional fisheries management tools, uh, for instance. And then the fact uh, that uh, there is a very strong reliance on uh, the uh, domestic legal system for assessing the gravity of, uh, of the offense and this um, and not having objective international criteria for that also creates some uncertainty on how a, a next case will be assessed. Uh, so that also creates some issues of legal certainty. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Celine, for your very insightful uh, presentation. And indeed, uh, this uh, procedure is not quite, uh, well, let's say popular uh, in other uh, uh, procedures uh, in terms of uh, love the sea or even other policy. 
And uh, when I uh, take a look uh, of your presentation and also uh, of your uh, writings, I guess uh, this is something that uh, we need to think about on how is the coastal state is actually uh, protecting its national resources. However, at the same time, uh, we uh, as a coastal state are quite, let's say, uh, in, ambig um, in ambiguous uh, in terms of uh, having this so-called justice. So if I may share with you that uh, in the previous time, uh, when we uh, arrest, uh, arrested uh, a number of uh, fishing vessels for conducting or committing uh, the illegal fishing, that uh, we are not trying to, uh, uh, let's say, having a, a capital punishment, but then uh, because of the, the, the fishing vessel owners is not uh, quickly um, uh, requesting for any bonds, then it goes to the to the uh, to the court, and then the court said, "Okay, you need to pay fines." But then uh, the owners or the 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 the, the masters cannot uh, pay the, the 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 fines, and then after that they well in that case you need to uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, substitute the fines into uh, uh, imprisonment. So it, it's kind of a not ideal situation. And then now we're trying to make a, a more, uh, as, as I said, a more sustainable uh, policy in, in implementing the prom release, in, which is actually is already in our uh, fisheries law. But then we're quite uh, 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 keen to to on how we uh, manage this uh, procedure because, uh, as you said, it is uh, very uh, what do you call it uncertain in terms of. Uh, 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 what call it, uh, determining uh, the bond itself. And then uh, one uh, might say that, look, if the coastal or if the flag state requesting a bond, then the flag state is actually admitting that the, the vessel is conducting the illegal fishing. Therefore, it would be uh, 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 subject to a labeling of, of, of the, the, the country that they will have a difficulties in exporting their uh, uh, fish product. Do you think mm. you agree with that? With the last point, not really. The so, I, yeah, with the last one, not really. So the fact of um, a state, a flag state, uh, requesting for the, the, the yeah, the, the, the fixing of a bond is not a, a, a sort of recognition of uh, culpability <laughs> of, of the of the, uh, of the vessel. Um, it is in its own rights. Uh, the international law uh, actually gave that right to flag states to uh, be able to ask for the release of the vessels in exchange for a bond, and it doesn't involve any assessment on whether there was a breach or not of the domestic uh, measures. Um, so and and please consider that also uh, often uh, and you can see that also in the cases in front of VIC laws, um, the flag states are sometimes well flags of convenience or open registries and they don't really care. Let, let's be honest, they don't really care on <laughs> whether the vessel is uh, guilty or not. Uh, um, and so it, and it is the ship owner or the insurance company which is actually really acting for the bond. Um, so th it, there is no, uh, I, I wouldn't read in the request for a prompt release any recognition of uh, culpability uh, for, for, on, on the, for, the, for the flag state, at least. Uh, but to be, just maybe to add also, um, I mean, the, the system of prompt release, the international procedure, really wants to be a safeguard in a way when things cannot be dealt at the domestic level. And uh, so the priority also in the law of the sea is for the coastal states to put in place a procedure of prompt release, uh, which will uh, hopefully uh, not require the intervention of it loss. Huh? Um, so the, the, the main focus is really on the implementation of the system by the coastal states and, uh, and the procedure at the international level. Yeah, as I said, it's just a safeguard. Okay. 
All right, thank you uh, very much, Celine, for your uh, uh, explanation. Uh, I guess uh, uh, for the participant, uh, uh, there's, uh, I want to uh, say hello to uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Associate Professor uh, Nandang Sutrisno from Yogyakarta, and then uh, Associate Professor uh, uh, Ibu Dina Sunyawati and Ibu Kostrianti. Uh, they are from uh, East Java. Uh, and um, all of us are uh, focusing on the love of the sea. Uh, is there any uh, comments or question from you, uh, Panandang, Bu Dina, Bu Anti? No, at the moment. Okay. So I will. Uh, yes, Panandang, you want to say something? So you're still muting, Pak. After someone uh, in the chat. <laughs> okay. All right. Because we in the chat. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I would like to uh, give the opportunity to Miss uh, Erika. Oh, okay, Pari, thank you. Um, hey. Actually, my question has already been asked. I'm sorry, I'm still in my bedroom and I'm kind of messy right now, so I'm not sure sorry, sorry. I want to show my face right now. Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, um, basically, my question has been asked by Pak Ari, Mr. Ari, about uh, those fl flag states that decline uh, or refuse to choose um, release. Maybe, maybe um, those countries, for example, uh, in Europe, Europe, uh, they don't want to use any. Uh, fishing product product that um, from uh, IUU uh, activity. So maybe it's not because uh, it's already uh, legally confirmed, but maybe it's more politically, I think. What do you think? Uh, well, the, 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 yeah, you're talking about the, the, the different cards, the yellow card and so, and so on, no? the, the access to market for when there are issues of are you fishing is that correct yes oh yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh well the, the, the two things are kind of um independent huh, from the from the prompt release uh issue so um the the so the european states are a bit in a weird position um there are destination states of uh, of course they're an important market uh, uh, for fisheries and and so there are destination states of uh, uh, import of, of uh, uh, fishing uh, products uh, but there are also flag states and they are not behaving all the time very well uh, we know that we have many uh, European vessels uh, actually uh, participating in, in IUU fishing uh, also. Uh, and at the same time, we are also coastal states uh, who wants to protect <laughs> uh, their own uh, EZ and, and uh, what remains of our uh, living resources. Um, so the, in relation to, to prompt release, I think, uh, the, the European states uh, in relation to IUU fishing have had some, yeah, ambiguous uh, uh, positions, uh, but just for you to know, um, and that's an internal European problem, um, the issue of the market, so the import in the EU is regulated at the EU level. Uh, so it's the European Union which has exclusive competence because we have uh, the common uh, fisheries policy uh, and we have a common market. Uh, when we look at enforcement, on the other hand, this is a state at the state level. So member states still have uh, competence, uh, almost exclusive competence when it comes to enforcement in the EEZ. Okay. with some common principles, of course, of reasonableness, uh, safeguards, uh, protection of fundamental rights, due process of law, and so on and so forth. But the, the specifics of what um, domestic uh, authorities can do, it's regulated at the member state level. 
and also which type of uh, prompt release procedures are available in front of domestic courts is regulated by the states. It's a bit Thank you, Celine. Thank you, Celine. Uh, Pananda? You want to ask something? I'm just wondering about, uh, yeah, just wondering if, uh, if you have uh, impressions about what have already been done by Ibu Susi uh, last period of uh, Pak Jokowi about sinking uh, vessels. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky question. Yes. <laughs> you do know the policy, right, uh, Celine? You know the, the practice of Indonesia to sink and know, block. Yeah, I know. I know the practice. Yes, I do. Um, so, from a prompt release perspective, it's not really fitting uh, because, of course, if you sink the vessel, you cannot release it anymore, um, and it is viewed. Uh, in a way as uh, a sanction before final decision on the merits, which raises, can raise issues of due process of law. Uh, and those are criteria, uh, principles uh, of international law. So uh, if ever a case of that nature would be brought in front of heat laws, that could be raised, that there was no due process of law. Now, I know that most of the time the sinking is decided with a proper uh, decision of, of a tribunal. The thing is whether the, and, and I don't know the details of the procedure, so there I'm asking you, um, so whether the crew and the ship owner has the possibility to contest and for how long and how much access to the procedure uh, do the owner and the crew have? Uh, because if there is that possibility and there are all the criteria, I mean, if they, they, enough time is given to the ship owner and so on to react and the ship owner decides not to react, sometimes it happens, huh? I can imagine, and so on, then there, there might be some, uh, you know, uh, possibility to argue about the legality of it, but it would be still a sanction. So it, it from an, an international point of view, it is seen as a sanction after a decision on the merits. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Salim, it's quite tricky though. I mean, I uh, yes. so no, yeah, but it, so in front of the, the domestic authority, does the uh, owner has an, uh, an op have an opportunity to contest? Uh, yes, uh, in front of the court. Before in front the, of the before the yeah. court. And, and how long does it take? Like, do you know? Like the the, uh, the arrest and the, are there data on how much how long? Does it take between the well, two? Honestly, honestly, I haven't done uh, that kind of uh, research. Maybe, uh, but you, uh, do you know this uh, uh, time frame? I, I thought you have uh, conducted this research. But by you, are you there? Uh, maybe it's just not that. Uh, by you is uh, one of the research from the Ministry of uh, uh, Ocean and Fisheries. Uh, uh, that, that would be something interesting to know, huh? because if you want to assess whether you comply with due process. Uh, principles uh, and in order eventually to avoid contestation afterwards uh, in front of uh, uh, ethos or so, the time frame is quite critical. Um, so between the detention, the arrest, the detention, and then the uh, the, this, the final decision, uh, because uh, yeah, the, and and that of course is a case by case assessment. Okay. Yes, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Associate Professor Ibu Kusrianti. Yeah, thank you, Pak Ari. Oh, Did you, do you hear me? Okay, yes. uh, Celine, uh, I read your abstract in your article, and you said that this from release is actually not stem from uh, dispute, right? Mm -hmm. And then you said in the your presentation that this is up to the coastal state 
uh, uh, concerning the due process, how to uh, manage from release, right? And then you said that it is, it's up to the coastal state whether this is administrative law, criminal law, or private law. So in my mind, the EU fishing is illegal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you or can we just apply this is a criminal? So this is crime. But in other hand, the UN clause said that uh, uh, you cannot prisoner imprisoner uh, the uh, the owner of the ship and the crew. So, do you do you have like a suggestion about this one? <laughs> because it is all of the is not 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 clear. It's legal mm. certainty is not clear. Yes. So uh, the the procedure is uh, actually it laws have a uh, universal uh, jurisdiction, right? No. Or, what do you mean universal jurisdiction? What uh, I mean uh, is about the UN clause. Mm -hmm. The clause, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because uh, in my uh, in our pre previous uh, discussion, Indonesia actually now is. Uh, is going to uh, apply the certain procedure to from release, but we still not certain about this is criminal, administrative, or or private. So this is okay. something yeah like that. Sorry. No, no, no. Don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, so, yes, the, the the law of the sea and general, I mean, in general, international law does not oblige states to uh, adopt a specific type of approach uh, to the measures. Uh, and most states uh, also uh, in, in Europe, for instance, we have a mix of uh, sanctions uh, stemming from, uh, as I said, administrative law uh, to uh, criminal law also, depending on the type of offense, uh, because IUU fishing, uh, of course, covers so many different types of uh, offenses and activities that some of them are better uh, indeed uh, regulated from an administrative point of view if we look at the issue of licenses, uh, for instance. Uh, um, but then, of course, there is the criminal part, uh, which is also uh, important. And there is the possibility to use criminal law. Now, under the criminal law systems, uh, imprisonment is only one of the many types of sanctions that can be uh, also um, taken from a, a criminal point of view. Uh, uh, so the Law of the Sea Convention, indeed, Article 73, uh, says that there should be no imprisonment uh, for a fisheries uh, sanctions, except if states agree otherwise. So there is uh, there a, a little window left open uh, by the Law of the Sea Convention and states could, for instance, at the regional level, agree that for certain type of very serious offenses, uh, imprisonment it, uh, can be an option, but there should be a clear agreement on that between the different states, so flag states, coastal states, and nationality states you know, of the, the people involved. Uh, but there is a possibility. But now, as I said, uh, from a, a criminal point of view, there are other sanctions that can be taken also, uh, and not only imprisonment, of course, very high, uh, high fines. Uh, it's an option, but also to uh, preclude the possibility of specific ship owners uh, to uh, enter again uh, in certain areas or to be able to apply again for certain licenses, to uh, have access to port, uh, to declare them persona non grata and so on. I mean, you have different options available there yeah. behind imprisonment. Yes, that's right. Uh, I think uh, uh, 
it's still a debate uh, because uh, in the area of uh, law enforcement uh, at sea, uh, we are trying to uh, switch or uh, move our uh, approach uh, of any uh, uh, violation of the law uh, from uh, imprisonment or uh, capital punishment into uh, administrative uh, 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 approach. So that uh, we think that uh, we should not always uh, 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 use the uh, approach of the criminal sanction, but then yeah. other, other approach can be uh, uh, taken as well. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think it's important also to keep a criminal dimension in the IUU fishing, and I would agree with keeping uh, criminal law involved for the more serious offenses. Uh, uh, I, I think, and, and that's quite a normal trend uh, uh, in almost all countries, also for environmental crimes. Uh, you, you have the concept of environmental crime and you, we use criminal law uh, to tackle them. So it wouldn't be so weird to still have a criminal dimension uh, for IUU fishing, but there are, as I said, so many different situations and activities which are uh, covered by that label that some of them might be better indeed tackled uh, from an administrative point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But most I companies that I know mix the two. Yeah. Huh? There is a, a bit of a mix of the different uh, sanctions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I saw this. Uh, Jeremy, you want to ask something? Uh, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah. Uh, it was a very uh, good presentation, uh, Celine, as expected from you. Um, I do have one question in mind, uh, maybe because I haven't read about uh, prom release that much. But yeah, what happens to the uh, you know this, uh, the the flagless vessels that that are detained? Because you mentioned and and the uncle said that it, it was the flag states that are responsible for you know, invoking that uh, prom release procedure. But uh, most of the times these vessels are you know, flagged to different countries and most of them also uh, flagless. So what, what would happen? Uh, are, are they, will, would they, would they uh, lose their rights to, to, to this? Yes, so um, if you don't have a clear flag state, then there is no prompt release procedure. Um, so it's a, it's a individual, individual, well, it's a right of the flag state. Huh? Uh, that said, uh, the tribunal in its case law has had quite some, um, well, um, was quite flexible in uh, deciding who the flag state was when there were problems of reflagging or of uh, temporary uh, registration certificate. Um, so, um, except if there, it is really clear, I mean, the, 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 that there is no flag uh, or that there is more than one flag and then it is like if it was without a flag, uh, then indeed no one can ask for the release. At least from an international point of view. Then it might still be in the interest of the coastal state to give the opportunity to the ship owner or the, uh, or the insurance company to uh, eventually apply for a bond. Uh, but that's, that's up to the sensitivity of the domestic state. Um, I have a question, Celine. Yes, you know yes. that uh, uh, ITLOS has a new seat, an additional seat in Singapore. I know, exciting. <laughs> Do you think that Singapore already foresee that it's going to be a, a, a more dispute uh, between uh, the countries surrounding uh, uh, the area so that uh, Singapore think that mm, maybe uh, the dispute may be uh, concerning uh, let's say boundaries or even prom release that can be not you don't have to go where to hamburg you can just go to to singapore for example what do well, you think <laughs> I, I i i find it it's a good move 
uh, because I, I really think, um, yeah, to have all these international tribunals in Europe, it's not so handy for many parts of the world. Um, so I think it is a, a, a very good uh, first step, at least from EATLOS, uh, to do that and to give the opportunity, maybe for certain countries, to be in a more uh, comfortable setting uh, for their disputes, in particular when we talk about uh, expeditious procedures. So I might think that maybe for the longer ones, the, the, the more complex dispute, uh, maybe it doesn't matter so much to be in Singapore, to be in Hamburg or to be in Buenos Aires. I mean, that's more or less the same, but for like very rapid ones, um, such as uh, prompt release indeed, or provisional measures uh, pending the constitution of an arbitral tribunal and so on, that could be uh, actually quite interesting for states to have a tribunal which is so close by. Yes, indeed. But uh, I really uh, uh, regret that why the move is not going to Jakarta instead of uh, in that, I don't know. <laughs> that I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't know the discussions there. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, is there any other uh, comments or uh, question to Professor Selene um, uh, that uh, she's already uh, kindly uh, uh, provide uh, her availability? Um, yes. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, Selene, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay, Anita. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Selene, uh, I would like to ask when assessing reasonable bond. Is there any uh, is there an opportunity to also consider the environmental damage or biodiversity loss involved in the offense? Thank you. Yes. So uh, yes, in assessing the gravity of the offense, uh, the the tribunal will look at the applicable law, and the offense could be of an environmental nature. Uh, so also because prompt release can be asked also for uh, pollution matters uh, and violations of fisheries law also include uh, um, living resources management and uh, sustainable use. So the environmental dimension of the offense will be taken into consideration in the assessment of the gravity of the offense. But what cannot be done is then to consider the environmental dimension in, uh, uh, co uh, in assessing uh, the, 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 the nature of the bond, as I mentioned. And that's what Australia tried uh, and it didn't work. And we don't have any other case. Maybe the tribunal might change its mind <laughs> in the future. I don't know, I hope actually. Um, but uh, yeah, for now that's what we have. And so that's it. That's it. Okay, thank you, uh, Celine, for your explanation. Okay, is there any other uh, question uh, or comments? Right, uh, I guess uh, 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 nobody, uh, uh, again, maybe it's, it's overwhelming, uh, it's digesting all of this uh, information. But then for uh, last uh, remark, Celine, uh, maybe you can have uh, 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 like a uh, uh, last comments on let's say a suggestion to a coastal state like Indonesia, if uh, we wish to have an implementation regulation in terms of the uh, prompt release, please, I mean. Ooh, uh, <laughs> well, um, what I may, so maybe the only, uh, yeah, recommendation that I, I feel uh, to, to, to give is that uh, to make all clear as possible a sort of table of gravity of the offense amount of the bond because that's what the tribunal is struggling the most and that's where uh, most of the fluctuation is in the reason in the reasoning huh? uh, so if you have a clear list of offenses with a clear you know uh, indication of the bond uh, more or less of this, of course, which will then vary on the basis of the value of the cargo of the vessel and so on, and with all the criteria, where you have this sort of uh, a clear metrics hmm, that is a reference point for the authorities, it will be also a reference point for the tribunal. Hmm. Yeah. 
Right. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Salin, uh, for your remarks. And then I guess uh, that uh, is uh, uh, marking our ends of our uh, first uh, guest lecture uh, for the association. And then we we are very honored and privileged uh, to have Salin uh, uh, to uh, give the lecture on prom release. And I would uh, uh, looking forward uh, for another. Uh, interesting and very uh, uh, exciting uh, um, uh, field of law, especially in international law. Again, on behalf of the association, Celine, uh, mm -hmm. we thank you very much. And uh, please, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, if we uh, ask you again in another opportunity, I hope uh, you can avail uh, your time again for us. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, for the last time, maybe uh, I can. Uh, request to all participants uh, for those who are available to uh, uh, turn on their video because we're going to have a, a picture uh, photo session. Okay. <laughs> okay, just, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really an honor to be to, to, to be the, the kickoff lecture of this series. It's a great initiative and uh, for your association and uh, so good luck for the continuation and thank you so much for having me and for listening <laughs> to me for the past hour and uh, if you have any question or so I'm, I'm of course available yes and for those who are thinking of uh, doing masters or phd in love the sea come to utrecht <laughs> <laughs> you can ask jeremia he was there last <laughs> two, yeah. two years ago yeah. no last year but last year finishing his uh, master's at Utrecht and he can share uh, his uh, experience uh, to all of you. Okay, <laughs> so if I may uh, count uh, to three for the uh, photo session, this is a virtual photo session. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> okay, um, one, two, three, again, one, two, three. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Thank you for your time, you, and uh, hopefully you stay healthy. And everyone, over you there. too. <laughs>